Hello, and it's lovely to be with you all this evening. I only wish that I could be there in person rather than giving a virtual talk, but let's hope in the coming months that that will be possible. And um, maybe even indeed we could all go on a ladybird search together and do some ladybird recording together. And this is what this talk is going to be all about. It's about unraveling the ecology of ladybirds together. So I'm Helen Roy and I'm an ecologist at the UK Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, but also as a volunteer, I run the UK Ladybird Survey with Peter Brown, who's from Anglia Ruskin University. So within the Biological Record Centre, I have the great privilege of leading the zoology side of things. And um, I really love this picture because it shows the huge diversity of recording that goes on across the UK with all of the different recording schemes and societies that are led by some just most amazing volunteers. And I always feel tremendously proud of all that is happening across this huge diversity of different taxa. And the Ladybird Survey is just one of many recording schemes and societies. And many of us have aspirations to be mapping the species and to be producing atlases. And one of our latest atlases is the third volume of a series for the water beetle atlases um, produced by um, Garth Foster. So we're celebrating centuries of biological recording and essentially still recording is just the same as it always has been where people go out and about and they record what they see, where they see it and when they see it and who they are. But I think what's really changed quite dramatically in recent times is the role of technology in biological recording and the um, use of apps, for instance, and online recording has really highlighted the ways in which data flows can be more rapid, for instance, and indeed more people are getting involved with biology recording as a consequence of these um, technologies. But still, the main motivation, the main aspiration is to map species and see where they are and just really celebrate the natural history of um, the wonderful wildlife that we have around us. So this um, animation here is showing all of the records that come in just to one system into the online system I record, which maybe some of you are using the app, maybe you've downloaded it onto your phones or maybe you use it back at home on your desktops. And I think what's just amazing is look at the coverage of records across the UK over just one year. It's just absolutely fantastic. And of course, we know there are some gaps, but really when we think this is all volunteer records arriving into just one online system, it's really remarkable. And of course, for me as an entomologist, I'm very excited to see that blue line on that um, figure over to the right being the sort of winning line, if you like, with the most records coming in overall. But of course, probably you're all aware that that's not the true story because data for plants and data for birds and indeed for other species as well comes into other systems. So this is just the iRecord data, but nevertheless, it's cause for celebration to see quite the number of records coming in for such a variety of taxa and across such a fantastic um, spatial um, spread. 
So just looking at the ladybird records, we get nearly 20,000, sometimes more than that, um, on an annual basis. And um, we get records of all of the different um, species, there's 47 different species um, in the UK. And when we take a look at the um, the number of records for each of the different species, actually year on year, since the arrival of the Harlequin ladybird in 2004, it often has been the most frequently recorded and indeed it still is the most frequently recorded in urban areas, for instance, in um, the, the south of England. However, um, in recent years, the seven spot ladybird is also doing extremely well. And um, for this particular year, which was um, 2019, 35 almost 36% of the records were seven spot ladybirds. But still, for a species that's only arrived in a relatively short space of time, the harlequin ladybird is doing very, very well. So we have a website for the UK Ladybird Survey, and um, this was set up back in 2005. And at the time, I was on sabbatical leave with Mike Majurus at Cambridge University, and he was leading what was called the Cox Melody Recording Scheme. And when the Harlequin Ladybird was first recorded in 2004, there was seen to be an opportunity um, to get more people involved in ladybird recording and also to track the arrival and spread of this invasive non-native species into other places across the UK. And so Mike and I worked together with um, Trevor James from the National Biodiversity Network and Peter Brown to develop the online ladybird survey. And I feel very proud that it was one of the first wildlife surveys. And when I look back and it was only 2005, it seems quite remarkable that we weren't doing more online given how much we're doing online nowadays and particularly um, in the recent months. Um, but it's really exciting to think that um, that led to an increased accessibility to the Ladybird Survey and indeed to mass participation with the Ladybird Survey. And going alongside that though, it was really important to make sure we produced lots of resources um, that people could use and could look to, to help develop their skills in identification, for instance, but also in terms of their deeper understanding of the ecology of these um, ladybirds. And so it was exciting to produce these fold out charts with the Field Study Council, and I'm a tremendous fan of all of their publications. They're just absolutely wonderful. We also um, produced the Ladybird Atlas. We updated um, the Ladybird Keys in the Naturalist Handbook. And very recently, we produced a field guide to Ladybirds of Britain and Ireland. And we took the opportunity within that field guide to kind of make it a, a hybrid publication and include an atlas within it as well. So each of the species accounts has a map and has the um, distribution trends reported alongside it. And it was just such a pleasure working with the amazing artist, Richard and also um, with Peter Brown and actually whenever we met and whenever Richard would bring along some of his latest illustrations I would just be absolutely speechless which is quite rare for me particularly when there's an opportunity to talk about ladybirds um, but they're just absolutely stunning. It's also important to make sure that people have lots of ways to contribute records and um, I record is a very popular way that people send in their, their records and indeed we have a smartphone app as well, a European ladybird app so people can record ladybirds all across Europe and indeed there's a number of different languages um, within that app as well to help people um, in other countries to get involved with ladybird recording. We have some fantastic collaborators um, across Europe who, who we work with on that particular project. But still we get records coming through in the post and people send in spreadsheets and emails and it's really important to allow people to send in the records in any ways they wish to do so. We also um, have quite an active presence on social media and, and I would definitely say that um, when I put the Ladybird survey on Twitter with at UK Ladybirds, I was quite a Twitter cynic. I wasn't really, uh, I wasn't using it for any other purposes at all and I wasn't really sure that I wanted to be, but I absolutely love it for natural history. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And if you um, are interested in, and you're not already on Twitter, you know, there's just some amazing activity around whether it be dragonflies or butterflies or the ladybird and people sharing their photos and sharing the excitement of the observations that they make. It's really just a wonderful um, opportunity to get engaged with the community in that way. 
And I think this also shows another way in which social media has been really great at reaching out to more people. So on this particular day, I can see June the 20th, um, I was writing a report in my office and I just thought, oh, I'll take a quick look, see what's happening on Twitter. And there was the school um, planning a ladybird day. And I just thought, well, that's amazing and something I would love to be doing. So I just said, you know, if you've got any questions or you want to chat at any point, just let me know. And um, what followed was a day of excitement of, of the children sending me through questions and telling me what they'd been finding. And it was just really exciting to be part of their Ladybird Day. And still my report got written, but I had a really lovely day in a virtual um, Ladybird survey. And this was a few years ago before um, we were in the current pandemic. And indeed, um, it's just always great to be able to go and talk to different people about ladybirds. And they are a really popular group of insects wherever you are in the world. And here I am in St. Helena, um, one of our UK overseas territories in the Mid-Atlantic Ocean. And I'd gone over there um, to work with people to make predictions about what might be the next non-native species that could arrive in St. Helena and have some kind of impacts on biodiversity and ecosystems. The airstrip for St. Helena is built in a cloud forest and it's particularly difficult um, for pilots to land there. So perhaps it's not at all surprising that we got stranded and we had an extra week over on St. Helena. So we had finished our work around the predictions of non-native species. And I took the opportunity um, to call some schools and say, I'd be really delighted if you were at all interested in chatting with me about ladybirds. And um, the schools were very happy for myself and pictured here as well, Tim Adrian's um, and also so you can't see but Chris Malumphy as well as in this picture too and we all went in and chatted about all kinds of insects but um, ladybirds from my perspective. And for all of us involved in the ladybird survey sharing that excitement and engaging with others has been really important to the promotion of the survey and getting more and more people involved and um, we've taken every opportunity to have um, articles in newspapers or in bbc wildlife magazine um, to do children's television programs or um, news interviews and it's really important not only in terms of promoting the survey but also in terms of being able to provide feedback around what are the latest results that um, are coming out of the ladybird survey data sometimes of course um, it can go a little awry with the media and um, a few years ago um, the tabloid newspapers got a hold of the story that ladybirds carry sexually transmitted diseases and um, there was quite a furore within the press and I was only too pleased to be contacted by Patrick Barkham who just said to me would you like to tell the story about these sexually transmitted um, diseases I guess it's not every day you get such an offer um, but I was only too delighted um, to chat with him and to talk about the fascinating life cycles of ladybirds and indeed the various parasites and pathogens that they carry and indeed they of course they do have um, some sexually transmitted diseases and why wouldn't they they're a very promiscuous group of beetles and so these diseases take advantage of that um, however it was great to be able to dispel some of the myths that were appearing um, within the tabloid media We've also had the opportunity to work a lot on um, alongside some amazingly talented um, authors of children's books such as Sonia Copeland Bloom who wrote The Adventures of Scarlet the Ladybird and also with Julia Donaldson on her series of books around what the ladybird heard and indeed I was lucky enough to go along to the launch of what the ladybird heard and to give a short talk about ladybirds and about the habitats that feature in her book. And just another nice way to be able to get more people involved or aware of ladybirds and ladybird recording. And Pete Brown and I had talked for quite a while about producing top trump cards, but we weren't really sure about how to get the resources to do that. And then one Friday, the BBC called me and said, for our campaign, BBC Breathing Places, we'd really like to have some ladybird top trump cards. Would you be happy to do that? I said, absolutely, I would. And Pete would as well. And um, they said, the only problem is we want all of the information by the following Monday. 
And I said, that won't be a problem at all. Pete and I have talked about it so many times. We already had started to construct a spreadsheet and think about the categories that we would include within those top trump cards. So indeed, we had a really enjoyable weekend um, producing the data to go into these um, cards. And indeed, we even had a chance to have them peer reviewed by some of our um, collaborators within the Ladybird world. And more recently, um, of course, things have been very, very different through the pandemic. And when I first knew that we were all going to be home working and that indeed it could be quite some time that we would be all home working, actually one of the things that I thought was that how will we continue to engage with others and to share um, what is possible through biological recording, even in these really difficult times. And already many people were talking about um, the well-being benefits of being out and recording, even if it could only be in someone's back garden or indeed looking out from their window on their windowsill or indeed a balcony. And I was really delighted to be invited to be part of the FSC BioLink series and to do a couple of webinars around identifying ladybirds and also identifying ladybird um, larvae. And it was just incredible to see how many people signed up and the kind of questions that we were given. And then to follow up with many people who had further questions that they wanted to ask via email and to see more people getting involved with biological recording um, through what's a really been a really, really tough time for so many people. So all of this work um, and all of the engagement and all of the many inspiring people who've been involved with the Ladybird survey has led to just this fantastic community. And when we've counted all of the names in our database, it seems we have more than 19,000 recorder names in the database. That's so many people who are out there recording Ladybirds. And it's, it's just, it's amazing to see how different um, recorders get involved in so many different ways. Some people get very fascinated by the parasites and have do some more work around that. Others use it as an opportunity to really engage with their local communities and get more people involved in recording within their doorstep, within their locality. And I just think it's inspiring. It's an inspiring and amazing community. And it's led to the fact that we now have this database with more than 200,000 records. And we can see over the time the, the records coming in and what we can, it's really apparent is that um, the online recording has really made a big difference. And um, we can see a huge surge in recording activity. And I think it, it isn't just the online recording though, it is also about the story to tell with the non-native species, the Harlequin ladybird that really got more people interested in ladybirds and interested in recording. And working with a PhD student, Charlie Uthwaite, who's now um, graduated and is a, a postdoctoral scientist, um, we calculated and looked at the summary of distribution trends over a 10 year um, time period, over, sorry, a 20 year time period. And what you can see on this table here, and we won't go through them line by line, you'll be very pleased to know, but are the species that are decreasing and those in green that are increasing and those in the pale grey um, that have stable um, populations. And perhaps it is quite alarming to see the number that are decreasing and only the small scattering that are actually showing an increase. But there are a lot that have these stable distributions. So when we look at the species in decline, they're very, very varied from the teeny tiny little um, ladybirds such as Dothorus punctillum through to the larger, more charismatic ladybirds such as the large ladybird Aphidecta obliterata or the hieroglyphic ladybird Coccinella hieroglyphica. And even one that in my childhood was very common and widespread, the two spot ladybird Adelia bipunctata, we're seeing really quite dramatic declines. And we're only seeing an increase for a very few species and some of those species are new arrivals, not only the Harlequin ladybird that's had a, a huge distribution increase, not surprisingly with its very rapid spread, but also a couple of rhizobia species, Chrysomaloides and Lafante as well, that are new arrivals and are cropping up in quite a few different places now. Excitingly, the orange ladybird and mildew feeder, we've really seen um, its numbers um, and distribution surge over recent decades. It used to be thought to be an ancient woodland specialist, but it's now found in many, many um, different places. And this beautiful, exquisite mildew feeding ladybird is just a, a pleasure to see. 
I think the rhizobius are really interesting ones. And if you're interested in getting into the tiny ladybirds, they're a good place to start because they're not too tiny and some of them are quite easy to identify, um, particularly, for example, Lefanti with its really bright orangey head, the reddish head and pronotum. Latura and Chrysomaloides are a little bit more difficult. You have to turn them over and look at this plate, the prosternal keel, but it's quite easy to get your eye in for those um, relatively quickly. And if anyone's interested, I'm very happy to provide more information. So I just thought we'd look at a few species in particular, maybe talk around some of the ID features, but also the distribution trends as well. So here's our very iconic ladybird, the seven spot ladybird. Um, and this one is showing a general distribution um, decline, even though I said actually in recent years we've seen a, an increase. And I think that does demonstrate, you know, we do see fluctuations with insects, as you probably all aware, quite dramatically year on year. So teasing out these long term trends can be quite tricky but the robust trend that comes out from that sort of 20 years of data is um, a decline. And then in this picture as well, a little black ladybird, the pine ladybird, Exocomus quadripustulatus, with the little red comma shapes just behind its shoulders. And that's one that's showing stable um, trends. I've already mentioned Adelia bipunctata and I'm going to come back to it because it has a, quite a strong story to tell with the harlequin ladybird um, interactions, but a very dramatic decline over the last 20 years of 43%. There's lovely mildew feeding, Silibora, um, the 22 spot ladybird, again a decline. The 14 spot ladybird, which you can um, identify, separate out from some of the other species, it can look a little bit like a 10 spot ladybird. But if you look at that marking behind the head, the pronotum marking, it has that sort of wiggly crown like solid black structure. And that is what is um, characteristic of the 14 spot ladybird. And, and that's an aphid feeding ladybird showing a very static, stable distribution trend. The water ladybird is one I really struggle to find and it is showing a distribution decline but I think I struggle to find it because I'm possibly just not looking in the patches where it's occurring in quite high numbers because there are patches where people find it in really high numbers um, but as much as I look in reed beds it's very rare that I see it. And this is the lovely Stathorus punctillum that I've already mentioned and um, it is most adorable ladybird in my mind. If you were to draw a little dot in front of you, that would be Stathorus punctillum. If you were to put some little orange appendages on it, that would be an even more accurate picture of our tiniest ladybird. We only have 50 records of the species, but we can still calculate a trend. And unfortunately, it's one of general decline. Then this is the um, species Clytostesis arcuatus, and it's a species we have hardly any records for, so we're not able to calculate a, um, a distribution trend for it. But actually, if you're to um, take a look at some of your bycatches, if you do moth trapping or any other insect sampling, then maybe you might find Clytostesis, and it would be wonderful to hear about your records. Then Skimnus interruptus is one that we're getting more and more records of. And I was really excited because I got the first county record for Oxfordshire. It was quite a while ago now, but I still celebrate it and tell everybody about it because that's what you do with the first county record, I believe. And it is my only county record. Um, but you know, there's lots of counties where it hasn't yet been found and it could indeed be a county record um, for you sometime. And it's quite a large inconspicuous ladybird. And you can see these, um, I mean, when I say large, I mean a matter of millimeters, so it's not huge, but it's possible that you could see it. And it has these really bold um, red triangular markings extending to the edge of the wings cases that make it quite easy to identify. So I just thought I'd finish and talk a little bit about the Harlequin ladybird. And this animation here shows that data that came in from members of the public primarily um, over the years that we've able to, been able to do so much with in terms of analyzing patterns of spread and looking at the different color patterns and all kinds of things. And it spread at about 100 kilometers um, per year. And just incredible the willingness of people to send in their sightings year on year that means we have this incredible database and one of the things that i was really interested in exploring was the um the role of parasites and pathogens within the story and to ask the question has the harlequin ladybird escaped natural enemies by arriving in this new region where the parasites and pathogens may not be adapted to it whereas we 
our native ladybirds do have quite a range from that sort of little braconid wasp that's pictured the cocoon in the very top slide, the forehead fly in the middle slide, and this lovely Lubberbenialian um, fungus on the lower slide. And if you're able to take a look for this Lubberbenialian fungus, you have a master's student working with me at the moment, and he'd be delighted to hear from you. If you see any little orange fruiting bodies or yellowy fruiting bodies, it's often not quite as profuse as it is on this ladybird, but nevertheless, it's quite, um, quite easy to see. So let me know if you see that one. And indeed, we, um, working alongside a few citizen scientists, um, we took a look at field um, observations and saw that the um, prevalence of pathogens in Harmonia exoridus, the harlequin ladybird, was much lower than it is in native ladybirds such as Coxnursa to punctata. So this does indeed suggest that the harlequin ladybird may have escaped its natural enemies. We're also able to, with this amazing data set that's been provided by um, volunteers, to look at what are the distribution trends in the presence and in the absence of the harlequin ladybird. And what we're able to see, and if you just, I won't go through all of these in detail, each panel is for one of eight native species. And the black line shows the data from Britain and the red line is the data from Belgium. And what we can see from the British data is that seven out of eight of the ladybirds um, decline strongly correlated with the presence of the harlequin ladybird. The only one that doesn't is the seven spot ladybird. All the others are adversely affected by the harlequin ladybird. In the case of the two spot ladybird, which showed that 44% distribution decline, it um, seems to be both a consequence of competition for the aphids, but also predation. The harlequin ladybird will eat the lady other ladybirds. And indeed, just to bring out that the orange ladybird, which I mentioned, has shown these remarkable increases in distribution. Um, and it doesn't compete with the harlequin ladybird in any way, or the harlequin ladybird doesn't compete with it because it's a mildew feeder and the harlequin is a predator. But the harlequin will eat the larvae and pupae of the orange ladybird. I just wanted to as well highlight the importance of global collaborations. That previous study I showed you was working with people in Belgium and Switzerland and also the Czech Republic. And this is um, working with some of our ladybird collaborators and friends from Chile. And Pete and I had the great opportunity to go and work with them um, for a few weeks in their summer to um, look at what they're doing with their ladybird survey, but also to take a transect up through the Andes to see how high do harlequin ladybirds go. And um, indeed, they go very high. And we got the highest record for a harlequin ladybird of 3,578 metres above sea level. And um, it was really beautiful up there. But what it shows is that the harlequin ladybird um, is very adaptable. And when it got really hot in the valley of the Andes, it was able to move up to higher altitudes um, to take advantage of the cooler settings. So that may seem a little bit frivolous in terms of just going to find the highest record of the harlequin ladybird, but actually we've been able to use some of what we've been doing with the harlequin ladybird for other non-native species and to launch citizen science for monitoring invasions much more broadly. And many of you would have heard the stories around Vespa velatina, um, the Asian hornet or the yellow-legged hornet. And um, we've been running a survey very similar to the harlequin ladybird survey for this particular species with an app and online recording and emails. And year on year, we're getting more and more and more records coming through of what people think are Asian hornets. Thankfully, the vast majority are other species, mostly European hornets, which of course are absolutely stunning, as is the Asian hornet, absolutely stunning. Um, but because people have been so good at sending through their sightings, it's meant that all of the confirmed sightings, which has really only been a handful, they've all been eradicated year on year since 2016. But you might be thinking, well, that's a huge number of records to go through within the email system and the online system. And it is indeed, it's a lot of work. So what we've been thinking about is, can we use image analysis in any way? And again, ladybirds have come through as a model system. So we've been developing some methods with the, with the um, various ladybird species to see if we can use image anal analysis. And indeed we can. We can see that by combining a whole variety of other traits and data around the records, such as habitat and information about the recorders, etc. Etc. we can get quite accurate identification. And so we're now trialing this with the Asian hornets as well. So just to conclude, I think this is 
amazing celebration of volunteer biological recording. I just find it genuinely utterly inspiring that year on year people provide these data sets and they do so with enthusiasm and with a sense of community that is just absolutely incredible and this goes such a long way in terms of contributing to biodiversity research and conservation and we need that because there are such big questions to address at the moment and we need these big data sets to do that and also by getting people involved with biological recording and citizen science it means that they can be more informed and more involved in decision making than would otherwise be the case. But putting aside the excitement of the ecology and putting aside um, the decision making for conservation, for me, I think what's most important is just that incredible joy of celebrating biodiversity together. And I think more than anything over the last year, we've seen that. We've seen how biological recording and wildlife observations can really help lift people's spirits and can really help us in these really difficult times. But actually at the same time, providing these crucial and critical data sets that are going to make a big difference in terms of us going forward as people um, so interlinked with nature. So I want to just thank all of the amazing volunteer ladybird recorders. They really are incredibly inspiring and indeed recorders of other things as well are incredibly inspiring. And thank you the Natural History Society of Northumbria for inviting me um, to speak with you this evening to the Ladybird Survey and Peter Brown for um, co-leading it with me and also um, to the Royal Entomological Society um, for all that they do in promoting entomology as well. So thank you all for listening and I look forward to your questions.